Welcome to this chess video. In this one, we have a really energetic game by Garry Kasparov. A lot of players assume that d4 openings tend to be very positional, and e4 openings tend to be very tactical. Well, this is simply not the case, because here we have Garry Kasparov going to end up as an exchange variation of the Queen's Gambit. And so he does start with d4, and in this we get a very dynamic opening. So if you want a nice illustration of some attacking chess, then of course stay tuned for this game. Now here this game is from 1988, this is from a Cup World event, and so that's why I left the countries here, where Ulf Anderson is from Sweden, Garry Kasparov is representing Russia, and without further ado, let's just get right to the game. So as mentioned, Garry Kasparov does start with d4, just goes to show that not always are d4 openings positional and e4 openings tactical. Now we have knight f6, which, like I said, it will become a queen's gambit declined. Here's just a different move order, whereas the regular queen's gambit would start, of course, with d5 and then c4. But back to our position here, c4 is played, e6, and then we have some normal developing moves. We have this exchange on d5, and now bishop g5. And we can see how the move order hasn't really changed much, and this is just a standard queen's gambit declined position. Now c6 intends to just reinforce d5, very common with this opening. Queen c2, bishop e7 developing, and we continue to play some very normal opening theory moves here. Now our first small critical moment here is choosing to go with knight g to e2, and this is a completely fine idea. I actually play this myself as white. With this knight move, you're trying to support the move f3, and long term get in pawn e4. Now of course the alternative to this would be developing your knight to f3, and then in those lines, you might be more inclined to play minority attack with your rook, you know, start pushing your pawn up here. And from that case, because this pawn will be your target, your knight on f3 is actually helping attack this pawn. And I might go a little more in-depth in a different video, as that's a little bit more opening specific. But here, this is a very fine idea as well. Rook to e8, castling, and then knight to f8. Very standard queen's gambit decline maneuver. f3. And now bishop e6. And now we're pretty much out of the main opening part that's really important here. At the very least, white has all of their pieces developed off the back rank, and the rooks are connected. And although black still hasn't done that, you know, this knight is going to come to g6 in many lines, and they're very close to getting their queen off the back rank. But the reason that this move is important here, this bishop to e6, is because it actually prepares something. And so it's actually preparing to put this rook here on c8, and then help support pawn to c5 which is especially annoying when white plays this f3 idea, because the whole point of f3 is to support e4. And once you have your pawn chain in this situation here, now this d4 pawn is actually a little bit of a liability. And that's why c5 attacking this is actually kind of an exploitative idea. Now, of course, this is not new, and Kasparov knows this, but these are some of the opening ideas that are relevant here. So with the fact that you know d4 is probably going to be weak, you have kind of two main approaches here. You can play a more positional idea, which is probably like rook to a to d1, and long term you're adding support to this pawn. The other idea is the more aggressive one, which is the one that Kasparov actually chooses in the game, which is to actually play rook a to e1. Now you're supporting e4, and maybe your center pawns will get really active and energetic, but long term you might have to worry some positional things because of the liability on d4. Now I just want to make one other comment here in this position, is why do we choose the A rook and not the F rook? And the reason for that is actually very simple, which is once this pawn does advance to E4, if there's ever an exchange here, then white would prefer to have this rook on F1 and get the half-open F file for attacking chances. And as we know, Kasparov is a really attacking player, so he would much rather have this rook on F1 and then bring his A rook to E1. But now we play rook to C8, no surprise here from Ulf Anderson. And now I kind of like this little move, which is just simply king to h1. And it's just very simply getting the king off of this somewhat dangerous diagonal. You might ask yourself, why is this somewhat dangerous? Well, it's dangerous because we've actually pushed this f3 pawn, and that weakens that diagonal that we were just talking about. And especially if you get e4 in, and d4 could be a target, we imagine a queen on b6, or maybe even a bishop on c5 after the pawn goes there, could actually be very strong, and this king might be in some danger perhaps even with a fork against b2, like if the queen was on b6. But all of those are more tactical ideas that are kind of patterns of the opening, and not so much in this exact position yet. So it's almost like a prophylaxis of just kind of a useful move that might need to be played at some point. 
Now we have a very common knight maneuver, which is the, bringing the knight back to d7. And the idea here is that we're trying to reinforce playing c5. Now you can see that the computer actually considers this questionable. And the reason why is because the computer actually has a different idea in mind, where they realize that this knight maneuver in this exact place is a little bit slow. And so the computer actually is saying that we need to be playing either a6 or the more aggressive pawn to b5. And in both cases, gaining queenside space before white has a chance to make use of the plans we have. Now, although the computer really likes b5, positionally, I don't really like it too much from black's standpoint, because now white has really easier play on this backward c6 pawn. Now, if you're an engine, you could probably hold this and say it's about equal. But from a human standpoint, I actually like the move that Ulf Anderson played in the game. Now, before we continue with the game, I just want to show one other thing real quickly, which is why not play c5 here? Why do we need to bring the knight here to support it? And so I'll put c5 on the board. And in this case, it's actually slightly early because after d captures and the bishop recapture, now white can just casually switch to positional mode and start playing against this isolated pawn. Now, the first step against an isolated pawn is to blockade it, as I talk about in this video here. I'll also leave the link to that in the video description. And so the first step against an isolated pawn is to blockade it, usually with a knight. And so knight d4 comes in. And so perhaps both players understood this in the game, and that's why c5 wasn't played. Now returning to the game position here, knight f to d7 was played to help support playing pawn to c5. So we have trades on e7. Queen captures e7 was also an interesting alternative, but we have rook's captures in the game. Knight f4. And although the effects of this next move are actually not going to be seen until a while later, knowing how this game turns out, I actually think this is arguably the point where Ulf Anderson might have started slipping in the game. I think from a theoretical point of view, knight to f6 is probably most natural. But in the game instead, we have rook to c7. And although this move isn't terrible, it does put the rook in kind of an awkward situation. Where it's not really the most harmonious here on the 7th rank. Especially with this rook already here. Now to show real briefly with this knight f6, I think white would be fine here to just play queen to d2, and the game would probably continue. But an interesting note here is you can even play more aggressively. Queen d2 is a little bit more positional, trying to reinforce maybe the d4 pawn against ideas like c5. But if you want to play an attacking style like Kasparov usually does, an interesting move might be pawn to g4. Because our king is already tucked away in the corner, we have a little bit more leeway in advancing pawns that are somewhere on these diagonals here. And if you're worried about the g-file being half open or entirely open, you might even be able to put a rook on g1 long term. And then it becomes a case of who exactly is attacking who. Now one sample line after this interesting g4 could be g5, trying to prevent white from playing g5 themselves. Bringing the knight back to h3 and then h6 simply to defend the g5 pawn. f4 continues the attack, capturing on g4, and then taking on g5. And this is slightly better for white. A player like Kasparov, who really likes dynamic play, might go for something like this. But returning to the actual position in the game, rook c7 was played instead of knight f6. And so now we have queen f2 by Kasparov, which I love this move. It's just simply prophylaxis, this queen is helping defend d4, in case e4 ever is advanced. And in some ideas, pawns might start rolling, this queen and rook battery might actually be really strong on the f-file. So this queen move is just really nice, and helping relocate the queen to a better square. Now knight to f6, which was slightly better earlier. But the reason why is because now at this point, white can actually force in pawn to e4, the move that they've been preparing all along. We have trades on e4, Notice the half-open f-file now that the queen has, and the fact that the queen is defending the d4 pawn, giving more credibility to the fact that the queen was relocated to f2. Rook c to d7. And now some really nice dynamic play by Kasparov. He simply advances his d-pawn to d5. And now these central pawns are going to become really energetic in this position. We have c captures d5. And now e captures d5 isn't quite as good, it's actually better to throw in an in-between move, and this is exactly what Kasparov does. He finds bishop to b5, which is a really cool idea, which almost forces, pretty much, the rook to go back to c7. I just want to note that you really don't want to advance this rook, because then, of course, pawn to e5 will fork both of these pieces. So rook to c7 was played in the game, 
But I want to point out an interesting alternative which almost works, it doesn't quite work, but instead of moving the rook, black could have actually tried pawn to d4. So black's rook is attacked, black is attacking white's knight. And a sample variation could be bishop captures d7, but now not a recapture on d7, bishop to c4. Queen captures d4, bishop capturing on f1, the recapture, and then taking back the rook on the d-file. And the reason that all this doesn't work is because at the end, white is going to actually grab the a7 pawn, and now white is simply up a pawn. Now, I don't know if Ulf Anderson realized in the game that d4 didn't work, or if that simply wasn't considered. But whichever the case, we played rook to c7. Pawn captures d5, and now retreating the bishop back to d7. And now it looks like white can probably fork both of these rooks with pawn to d6, but that actually would be a mistake in this position. Because if you play d6 too early, then black can trade rooks on e1, and then their hanging rook on c7 can sacrifice itself by capturing on c3. And although this might look fairly tricky, white really doesn't have a great response to this. Now they can try bishop captures d7, rook c4, bishop b5, and then rook to b4, and now white needs to save their bishop. So probably bishop back to f1, but then queen captures d6. At the very least, black is one material. So instead of d6, white prepares that by playing the bishop back to e2. And now there's a real threat because there's no longer the option of trading the rooks on e1. So black needs to sidestep the fork, they retreat their rook back to c8, and so now Kasparov goes after the a7 pawn. We have pawn to b6, queen to a6, knight to e4, and now the dynamic play continues with pawn to d6. Now if they were to bring their rook back, we can probably trade here on e4, they can recapture with their rook, and then our knight can come to d5. And the combination of the knight and pawn here is very strong, with possible ideas like knight coming to e7. But I don't think this is something that Ulf Anderson is really considering too much, because it just very obviously is bad for black. So they must play more actively than that, they probably can't move their rook, that would waste too much time. They have to accept taking the d6 pawn. So now we get knight f to d5 anyway. And then a very natural looking move, which the computer is not a huge fan of, which is rook to e5. Very natural to be attacking this knight, kind of keeping the c3 knight tied down. But the engine actually prefers to put this rook on e6 instead of e5. And the idea is that if there was this capture here on b6, Black can now play queen to g5, and try to get some counterplay on white's king. Possibly with the queen here, or maybe the rook coming over to one of these other files. Now, I don't know if both players considered this in the game or not. Perhaps they did, because in this variation, white can simply retreat their queen back to f2, and white has a slight advantage here. Now, keep in mind, they did win a pawn here on the queen side. So white is up material, but their king is also completely safe. I don't think Ulf Anderson really wants to play this as black. And so instead he plays this rook to e5, but now we get queen captures b6, knight f5, trying to bring more attackers towards white's king, while also saving their knight from danger. But white is up material, and generally when you're up material, you want to trade pieces. This is exactly what we have here, we have a chance to trade queens, and even a tactical dynamic player like Asparov is going to take this opportunity here to trade queens. So he trades, Rook captures back, and now bishop d3. And if they want to trade rooks, again, this is probably to Kasparov's benefit. Now in this case, because of the location of the rooks, it probably is good for both players to trade. So they do, but long term, this is probably something that is going to favor the side with more material. In this case, that is white being played by Kasparov. Knight g6, getting a piece off the back rank and trying to get another attacker a little bit closer to white's king here. But just because the central pawns that Kasparov had are now gone, that doesn't mean that their play with pawns and dynamic ideas aren't completely gone either. Because now they have two pawns on the queen side which could be very strong in this endgame. And the first move is pawn to a4. Knight d4, trying to improve their knight. And then a5. And their idea is very clear that these two connected pass pawns are going kind of hard for black to stop. We have king f8, just simply trying to bring their king towards the center as very common in the endgame. Again, trading pieces is usually going to favor the side with more material. Now we continue playing this endgame, slowly improving. Trading rooks when they have the chance. And now pawn to b4. 
And we can see how White's advantage is just slowly growing. Bringing the knight back into play on e6. And now pawn to b5. And this is simply too strong, these two pawns. And Ulf Anderson resigned in this position. And so I don't know about you, but this game really didn't feel as long as it was. I mean, here, objectively, it was 38 moves. But psychologically, it just feels like White really controlled the game with their energetic play. And quite frankly, blew Ulf Anderson off the board here. And Ulf Anderson is not that weak of a player either. We can see by his rating that he was a very strong player. And if you want to see a game where he beat Anatoly Karpov, you can check out my video on the Hedgehog opening, which again, I'll leave the link in the video description. So I hope this video is just one more example to show you that sometimes d4 can be very dynamic and tactical, and e4 can sometimes be very positional, and that openings really have a lot more flexibility than a lot of players think. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. I'll see you in the next chess video.